second in our fall series of Philosopher's Cafes. Um, the theme for um, the series of this fall is what makes a healthy society. And um, we'll be having a cafe every other Saturday until December the 10th. <clears throat> And uh, they're always right here at Steeps and at this very same time. The uh, next cafe is two weeks from today. That's going to be on um, Saturday the 15th of October. And we're going to have uh, Jenny Birkenbosch, who is an artist and also co-owner of the Sun Dog, Sun Dog organic farm, and she's going to speak on this question. Can localism, I think that's a neologism of some sort, can localism revive community and challenge consumer society? So that's going to be two weeks from today, right here, same time. So, I, I should introduce myself, I guess, if there's anybody new here. I'm Martin Tweedale. Uh, I'm a retired professor from the University of Alberta Philosophy Department. Usually, my co-conspirator, David Goa, is also uh, here, but um, he's been detained at a wedding in uh, Le Duc and uh, probably won't make it. Um, that unfortunately means that we'll probably be without the use of our usual roving mic, um, which means that <clears throat> when you enter the discussion after uh, Gordon has finished his uh, beginning presentation, be sure to speak up. Um, <clears throat> if it looks like people can't hear you, we'll, we'll try to repeat uh, what you said. Um, so let me remind you of the uh, way things go. Um, we have our animateur, whom I will introduce in a minute. He will speak for uh, 20 to 30 minutes or so. And then we just open the whole thing up to discussion. And um, the discussion will go to something like 2.20, 2.30. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll take a break for 20 minutes and then come back for a finishing discussion with everything having to wind up by 3.30. So, um, all right. Um, our topic for discussion today is um, powering down. Let's see if I can get the exact title here. Here it is. Um, power down to a post-carbon -car future. And our animateur is Gordon Laxer, who is a professor in the sociology department at the uh, university. And <clears throat> he's also co-director of the uh, Parkland Institute. Uh, Gordon got his PhD <clears throat> in sociology from the University of Toronto in 1881 and came to the University of Alberta the very next year and has remained here ever since. Right. Um, he's written, uh, I'll just give you one book to give you a sort of a taste of uh, what he writes about. Uh, this book is entitled Open for Business, The Roots of Foreign Ownership in Canada. He was also the principal investigator in a uh, project <clears throat> that was sponsored by um, the Social Sciences and Humanities uh, Research Council of Canada, usually known as SHRC. Um, and the investigation was this. It was on neoliberal globalism and its challenges, reclaiming the commons in the semi-periphery. By the semi-periphery meant places like Canada and Mexico, etc. And he's now working on a book to be titled Freezing in the Dark, Energy Security for Canadians. He is, I know, he, very interested in uh, questions of energy 
and uh, that's going to um, be what he'll be talking about to us today. So, Gordon, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, it's great to be back here. I was actually here in February 2010, and I guess I didn't do too bad a job because they did invite me back. Um, but it's, uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, first thank Martin and uh, David for organizing these, this a beautiful event, uh, actually bringing the university out to the community. I think the university's way too much in the cloisters and so this is a great opportunity to engage with people in the community um, and, uh, and it, it's in a wonderful atmosphere here at Steeps as well. Well, um, I sometimes uh, work with PowerPoints and I can put images up and uh, I'm going to have to paint word pictures though. Uh, of course, I'm not a poet, but uh, I'll do my best. Um, the, the, uh, okay, the image I wanted to, to really to start off with is to think uh, of Albertans as the bisons running along together near Fort McLeod. Um, and uh, they're enjoying the good times together. Um, yes, uh, of course, the head smashed in Buffalo Jump is uh, not too far ahead. Um, but they're, everybody's happily running along and enjoying each other's company, uh, saying we've never had it so good. Well, a few uh, bison warn that we're headed in the wrong direction and there's a cliff ahead and we've got to change course now. Uh, most shout down those naysayers uh, as, uh, you know, uh, we're having a good time, just go away. Um, I see this as my role, um, as one of the few warners in Alberta, that as Richard Heinberg uh, says, uh, the party's over. Uh, we are near the end of the age of cheap oil. Not the, end, not the end of oil, but the end of the age of cheap oil. And we must shift direction uh, and adopt a new paradigm. We cannot have continual growth in a finite world. Um, so we ha we, that's impossible. We're going to have to move towards sufficiency, towards enough. My argument goes as follows. The era of cheap oil in the world was going to end very soon, within the next 5, 10, 15 years, exactly when we may even be in that right now. Uh, Alberta can try and hang on to the last gasp of the fossil fuel extraction and then go into an abrupt fall. Or we can embrace the coming age of uh, uh, power down uh, and moving off carbon fuels. And I think it's much wiser to choose the latter, to, uh, uh, to actually make, uh, start making the transition now. Or else I think I'm worried we're going to be end up in the fossil fuel belt, which is going to be analogous to the rust belt of the auto industry around Detroit. Now, advocates of the capitalist model of, uh, uh, and transnational corporations label my perspective pessimistic. I reject that. There's lots of evidence to show that the world is at the brink of peak oil and, in fact, peak many other resources. Uh, but it is nowhere near peak equality, peak social justice, peak real democracy from below, peak living in, in tune with nature, and peak human happiness derived from the most important things in life. Once our basic needs are met, we get much more satisfaction from valuing nature and each other more than getting more stuff. And I believe we can develop that kind of society, and that's why I'm an optimist. To get there, of course, we need a cultural turning, a political turning, and an economic turning. And I'm going to focus on Alberta's role in the shift to a sustainable energy security that is good for Canada for Alberta and for the world. I'm going to, of course, make some provocative statements, and I hope this will spark some discussion. Um, and I'm happy to back up my points uh, in, uh, with supporting evidence and arguments during the, the discussion. Um, OK, so the world is uh, going to experience uh, a series of severe international oil shocks, 
Uh, like the kind we had in the 1970s, we had a couple of them then, uh, but they're going to be more severe, um, and it's going to be uh, really the end of the age of cheap oil. Now, we're not running out of oil. There's still going to be oil in 50 years, 100 years. But we're running out of the cheap stuff, the low-hanging fruit. Um, and it, it, it means a lot, the fact that we're going to end up... So, you know, uh, oil is somewhere now around $1.20 a liter. I can see it going up to 5 to $10 a liter within a decade. Um, and uh, cheap oil, in fact, rather than the Industrial Revolution, or even more than the Industrial Revolution, is what allowed uh, the 20 or so, 20% uh, or so, 1 billion people in the world to live very well. Uh, three tablespoons of oil is equivalent to eight hours of human labor. So we, they have been our free slaves. And as Thomas Homer Dixon says, so long, free slaves. Cheap oil is what enabled globalization, the death of distance. So it is, in the recent period, it has been as cheap to import something from halfway around the world because of cheap transportation than, to, than from next door. And that's why there's been that huge shift of production. But not for much longer. Okay, I want you to look at that handout. I've, I've got a color one. It would have been easier to read if I had been able to reproduce it in color. But the interesting thing is, okay, now who, who produced this? Was this some kind of extremists who want to kill Canadian jobs? As Tory uh, MP David Anderson, Parliamentary Secretary to Natural Resources Minister Joe Oliver, said the other day about the brave protesters in Ottawa, many of them Albertans who said no to the tar sands and yes to the environment, I'm afraid not. This is not the loony left environmentalist. This was produced by the Energy Information Administration of the U.S. Government Department of Energy. And it's also been backed up by the, the U.S. Uh, military. Uh, so what it, uh, what it shows um, is uh, the production, uh, is uh, the, 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 the line here is 2012. This is demand that is going up, and this is production that is going down. Uh, and that production is made up of a number of things. The bottom one is uh, OPEC existing conventional, then the next big one is uh, non-OPEC conventional, including conventional from Alberta. About half of Canadian oil is conventional. Um, and you keep, then, then there are some new things coming in. Now, if you look at that very narrow third band from the top, very, very narrow, um, that is all of the non-conventional, non-OPEC oil in the world that's going to be added in between now and then the next two decades. So that includes the tar sands, it includes Venezuela's Orinoco belt, the bitumen in Nigeria, and other forms of heavy oil. Uh, you see how much, remember we've heard that term, it's a game changer? That will not, uh, the, uh, if the, uh, the bitumen sands gets up to full production, it will not replace even one year of the annual depletion rate in world oil. Uh, this is not a game changer that we have in this province. Um, the uh, CAP, the Canadian uh, Association of Petroleum Producers, estimates that by 2025 the tar sands will be producing 3.3 million barrels a day. And that's about double what it is now. I'm not even sure that there's enough water for that to happen, but let's say it does. As so I say, it won't even replace one year at full value of, of one year's depletion. Um, so instead of being a, a game changer, it's more like small change. Um, so, uh, I mean, if, if just think of it, the world is now producing 89 million barrels a day of oil. And so 3.3 million is not a big deal. It's, it's, it's less than 4%. The United States itself produces, and people don't realize this, 10% of the world's oil. They are the third largest oil producer in the world. Of course, the, the bitumen sands are all intended to be exported to the U.S. There was a report done a few years ago for the U.S. Department of Energy called the Hirsch Report. 
and it said the world was running out of cheap oil. And there was another report at the same time by Robert Gates, who's the, uh, the Secretary of Defense, called Shockwave Report. And what that report showed was that if we took 4%, if there was some kind of reason, whether there was a, a, a blockage of oil in the Persian Gulf or, or whatever, you take 4% of the production, world's production, off the, the, the scene, and the, the price of oil will almost, almost triple just by 4% reduction. We're talking here, looking at this graph I handed out, of 40% reduction, not 4%. Um, so, you know, if we had a 4% reduction, what the, what the U.S. government uh, studies show is that instead of $80 a barrel, which it is about now, it would be up to about $220 a barrel. And that's only a 4% reduction. So when I'm talking about the end of the age of cheap oil, it is, and as they show, it is pretty well at hand. Of course, there is a huge demand. There's China and India and other places that are increasing. Um, so, so long globalization. Hello, renationalization and relocalization. I think that's going to be the, the next talk. Um, not necessarily bad. Um, there's going to be the return of manufacturing to Canada. Um, hello, local industry. Goodbye, cheap Chinese products and Walmart. It's, if the low-hanging fruit of cheap oil was still available, why would the corporations, oil corporations, scrape the bottom of the barrel and search for more of the toxic stuff in the deep ocean, the Arctic, and Alberta's tar sands? Remember the BP uh, spill, the disaster spill, the Deep Horizon blowout in the Gulf of Mexico. They spilled oil for three months. Uh, 4.9 million barrels were spilled into that the, the Gulf, killed 11 men, and a huge number of fish and other marine species. It cost BP over 80 billion. Now that isn't chump change, even for a big corporation like that. If they got hit one or two times more with that, they would be out of business. The corporation stock value fell by 40 billion. But guess what? BP is back in the Gulf. And so are all the other majors. How come? There is nowhere else to go. Uh, the cheap, easy, conventional oil is gone. Um, why do the oil companies keep doing this? Because their stock value depends on their reserves. A few years ago, Shell announced that its reserves were lower, and its stock fell by over a billion dollars in one day. So they, they are they, in a desperate drive. And all of these new forms of uh, sources of oil are incredibly toxic, much more environmentally risky than the present uh, sources. Um, well, OK, uh, if you still don't believe me about uh, the world running out of cheap oil, here's a great quote I love from Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Rashid bin Saeed Al Maktoum. My father rode a camel, I drive a motor, my son flies a jet plane, his son will ride a camel. <laughs> um, well, what does all this mean for Alberta and Canada? Well, the rest of the world is going to be getting off oil in the next generation or two because it's got to. Uh, there, as I showed, there, there just isn't enough of this stuff to go around. The world price will not be affordable for most people, including drivers, most drivers in Alberta. If we let the, deter the market purely determine who gets the stuff, guess who's going to get it? The rich and the military. Um, and very useful, too. The U.S. Air Force burns 60 gallons of jet fuel a minute to fly one F-35, and they keep them up in the air 24-7. Uh, better, of course, that they do that than that some ordinary working Jill can drive to work. Um, another quote of wisdom from Saudi Arabia, the country with the most recoverable oil and the most of the, the, the greatest amount of cheap oil, Sheikh Yamani. Does anybody remember that name, Sheikh Ahmed Zaki Yamani, who used to be Saudi Arabia's uh, foreign oil minister? He was the most quoted uh, guy in the OPEC in the 70s and 80s. This is what he said, quite an interesting quote. The Stone Age didn't end for lack of stone, and the Oil Age will end long before the world runs out of oil. 
Well, that view is echoed, in fact, by Clive Mather, the former CEO of Shell Canada. He said this year, 30 years out, we won't be burning hydrocarbons the way we do today. Our enemies may not be at the door yet, but they are beginning to circle around Alberta. And burning carbon is not only causing dangerous global warming, it is a great economic threat to Canada's economy and that of the world's economy, as well, of course, as other species. There was a report that was issued just two days ago, on Thursday, by the federal government, but, uh, I don't know if anybody saw it, the National Roundtable on the Environment and the Economy. This was for the federal government. And they, this they had a, a blue ribbon um, the group of uh, businessmen and economists who came out with this. They said that global warming is going to cost the Canadian economy $5 billion a year by 2020 and something like 21 to 43 billion a year by 2050. This is very much like the Nicholas Stern report that came out in England five years ago. If this is the cost of global warming, should Alberta, the federal conservative governments, uh, and the oil uh, transnationals still be climate change deniers? And what's gonna happen to Alberta if the world moves beyond oil and rejects dirty oil Will we become a ghost province? So you've heard of a ghost town. Uh, how about ghost provinces? Or well, maybe not. Maybe not totally ghost province, but maybe a bit like Atlanta, Canada, where the young have to go down the road with every generation to find something away from home. Here's a quote from Anne McMullen Bellavo, who uh, grew up in Nordegg. When the mine shut down in 1955, everybody just packed up and left, everything as it stands today. Well, for the long term, I, uh, there's um, Peter Lougheed, former Premier of Alberta, who of course sat, was Premier during the great uh, first boom in the 70s. He said very wisely, and I quote, fresh water is more valuable than crude oil. You can imagine Alberta without oil, but not without water. And that, of course, is the great lesson that, and the great debate that's going on in Nebraska right at this moment. Um, there is a huge opposition growing in that state to the Keystone XL pipeline that's going to bring tar sands oil to Texas. Uh, saying, they are saying the same thing. Don't foul our Ogallala water reservoir, which in fact is half the size of British Columbia, uh, with your dirty pipeline, uh, dirty oil uh, pipeline. Uh, because if that, if the, uh, there's an oil spill, like there was in Kalamazoo, Michigan last year, bringing tar sands oil uh, east uh, that got into the river system, if that got into the Og Ogallala Reserve, this is a very dry place. Everybody, the farmers would have to pick up and leave, the would have to leave, people would have to abandon Nebraska. So, what is the choice then? Do you threaten uh, the long-term health of communities there for some kind of short-term temporary construction jobs. And it's the same issue that is facing Alberta. Um, I don't know if you saw last spring, the, the, with the Alberta's Premier Council on Economic Strategy, headed by David Emerson. David Emerson, if you remember, was the trade minister under uh, Stephen Harper's first government. Uh, David Dodge was also on this. This was, this was a pretty uh, blue ribbon um, corporate uh, report. David Dodge was the former Bank of Canada governor. And they said, and I quote from that report, the creation of an affordable, environmentally friendly alternative to oil would be a great thing for the world. But it could be economically devastating for Alberta if, when it happens, we are still heavily dependent on oil exports. So what all these people are saying is it's extremely dangerous to put all your eggs in one basket, especially if that basket is dirty oil. So, you know, what you keep hearing is what is good for the tar sands producers is good for Albertans is patently false. That is not good for Albertans. Yeah. Um, if Alberta's uh, tar sands are not a global uh, game changer, how important are they for U.S. security? We keep hearing that they're important. Well, there was a report done by Michael Levy a couple of years ago 
uh, on the tar sands for the New York-based Council on Foreign Relations. Now, this is an extremely influential body in New York City that kind of advises Washington on, and is very much part of the, the establishment there. Richard Haas, uh, president, wrote in Levy's report uh, an introduction here that says that the oil sands are not critical. He said that they are not critical to U.S. energy security. Now, the, the interesting thing about Levy's report is that Levy said, and, I, and I'm quoting from this, this is the environmental impact, and showing the impossibility of the continuance of the expansion of the tar sands. He said, and I quote, imagine that oil sands emissions rose as expected over the next two decades and then stabilized in 2030, while total U.S. and Canadian emissions dropped by 80% by 2050, an oft-proposed target, this is still quoting from him, Oil sands emissions would then become equivalent to about 10% of U.S. emissions by 2050, representing almost all emissions from Canada at that point. So, in fact, if we ramp up the tar sands and if we start cutting emissions, because we, we have to stop dumping this stuff into the world's common uh, biosphere, uh, what it will mean is that by 2050, the tar sands will take up 100% of our emissions, and so, you know, heating your home and driving to work and doing all of those unimportant things, uh, you'll have to cut that stuff out so we can continue to export the tar sands, uh, mainly uh, for the U.S. Uh, oil addicts, as uh, George Bush called, uh, said, the, the U.S. is addicted to oil. So the U.S. doesn't need Canadian oil or any foreign oil, actually. Um, if the, if the United States went down to British or Swedish levels of oil consumption per capita, and they have about the same level of uh, standard of living, they wouldn't import oil from anybody. They have enough oil to live on on their own. As I say, they are the third largest uh, oil producer in the world. Uh, they have 4.5% of the world's population. They produce 10% of the world's oil. So they don't have to find oil under anybody else's sands in the Middle East or in Alberta. Uh, they, can, they can live on their own oil. Now, Jimmy Carter said when he was president in 1977, the United States wastes more oil than we import. That was true then and it's still true today. Um, now, Canadians should be sitting pretty. With the end of easy oil looming, Canada is one of the few industrial countries with enough non-fracked conventional oil to last decades. We could phase out the tar sands and still have enough oil to get Canadians through as a transition fuel to a post-fossil uh, fuel future. However, Canada is squandering its advantage by giving the U.S. first access to two-thirds of our oil and over 60% of our natural gas. That's what NAFTA says we must do. Even if we have shortages in Canada, we must continue to export two-thirds of our oil, uh, this is NAFTA's proportionality clause, and over 60% of our natural gas. Now, the interesting thing is no other country in the world uh, uh, is required to do this, um, uh, and the proof is that nobody else has signed on this kind of deal. Um, meanwhile, Canada imports half the oil we use. I don't think most people, most Canadians do not realize. Here we are. This country has, is the 35th in population in the world. We have the 35th largest population. We are the 14th largest oil importer in the world. We import almost a million barrels a day of oil. And half of that comes from OPEC countries. Thus, despite our rich endowment, Canada cannot provide enough domestic oil to Eastern Canadians when, not if, the next international supply crisis hits. That's why my book is called Freezing in the Dark. I got at that from the, you know, the bumper sticker from, remember, 30 years ago, let the Eastern bastards freeze in the dark. I take the opposite tack. I say, let's, put, let's, let's make sure that the Eastern, Easterners do not freeze in the dark. Um, most countries, of course, would not sign a proportionality clause. Uh, you know, if you don't get access, first access to your resources, and you let other people get it. You know what that means? It means you're a colony. That's the definition of a colony. Um, so, you know, far from Canada being the energy superpower, 
Uh, Canada is an energy sa uh, satellite. And it's a big mistake that leads, leaves Eastern Canadians unnecessarily vulnerable. Now, there is, there is a problem with this arrangement as well, another problem then, uh, having to do with the environment. Canada cannot cut carbon emissions as long as we're grow, uh, locked into these growing bitumen exports. Carbon emissions from the, the tar sands are the fastest growing source of carbon emissions in Canada. And this creates a negative feedback loop. If Canadians cut oil use, so you, you convince Canadians you've got to cycle, you've got to drive smart cars or whatever to take, take transit, you know what's going to happen? More Canadian oil, that, the, the oil they've saved is going to be exported to the United States. It's going to get locked into the proportionality clause, so it means we have to export even more. So you say, okay, look, you've done all of those things so more Americans can drive SUVs and Hummers. So that, that's going to be a great incentive for Canadians um, to cut back on their use. So I, that's what I call a negative feedback loop. Um, there is a virtuous uh, loop available. The key is to tie Canadian oil output to domestic use and phase out all, uh, or most or all of our energy exports. We did this in the 70s. We told in 1973 when, we, when the United States was getting 20% of the oil from Canada, we told the Americans we were going to phase out exports of oil entirely. They didn't declare economic war and they didn't invade. Um, so what would happen then if we then use our own oil, conventional oil, non-frac conventional, and we have enough in this country to do that, because we produce about as much as we consume, that as those go down, we have to power down at that same rate. Uh, and it would mean then that we would be in control of the emissions we make. We can't control how much the Chinese or the Americans are emitting, but we can collectively control how much we in this country emit. Um, now, so, um, and of course there are great advantages to uh, powering down. I think we can get closer to nature, to each other, and I think there's an opportunity to develop a more just society. Instead, what we hear is continually is that the oil sands are Canada's great economic engine and major job creator. Not true. It does create many temporary uh, construction jobs. And if you look at all of these projects around Fort McMurray, there are about 10 times as many jobs in construction as when that ends and the operation uh, begins. So the, it's, they're temporary jobs. But these jobs, and all of them, even including the temporary ones, kill more jobs than they create. And if anybody's heard of Dutch disease, um, it's a term that The Economist magazine uh, uh, coined in the 1970s, um, and it goes like this, that an oil, uh, well, it was natural gas off the North Sea for, the, for uh, the Netherlands, that all of that natural gas was driving up the value of the Dutch gilder, and that killed uh, more manufacturing jobs in the Netherlands than it was creating in the natural gas industry. Well, there was a study done in 2009 for Industry Canada uh, Canada, lo between 2002 and 2008, Canada lost 350,000 jobs. And this report uh, says that, it, that the, uh, the export, the increase in export of oil, killed over half of those jobs. Um, because what it did is it drove up, remember the dollar back in 2002 was about 62 cents, and now it's somewhere around par. Well, it killed those permanent manufacturing jobs and more than the jobs in, uh, in uh, around Fort McMurray. Okay, so it's dangerous for Alberta to place all its eggs in the tar sands basket, and the danger is that Alberta will sink into a carbon belt. Um, the peril is that Canada and Alberta, uh, okay, will be stuck in this kind of belt, um, and we can't let uh, wait for the market to do us, uh, uh, help us out. It did not do that in the Rust Belt. Now, um, Mike Kudima, who led those uh, demos in uh, Ottawa, and I have a great respect for uh, Mike Kudima, he says, shut down the tar sands. Now, while I agree with that sentiment, I think if we did it immediately, it would be a disaster for Alberta and Albertans. The tar sands are too central to the work of provinces, workers, and families to do it immediately. 
The challenge is to convince Albertans that the present course is no longer viable and that phasing out the oil sands over the next 15 years is pro-Alberta and pro-Canada. The sooner we stop being a tar nation, the better. Instead of building new tar sands projects, the smart thing would be to divert the construction jobs there into doing something positive, like retrofitting buildings, constructing new LRT, building a high-speed uh, train connection between Calgary and Edmonton, um, bus lanes with their own rights of way, all uh, building new uh, city design, uh, densifying cities so we have transit, cycling, walking become a dominant means of transportation and also produce much more lively neighborhoods um, with less energy intensity. Making Alberta greener and less energy intensive also has a bad, uh, the added benefit of creating a lot of jobs and generally good ones. Alberta posts um, economic models and multiplier uh, tables that predict how many jobs are created in different economic sectors for every million dollars invested. Well, there's 56 sectors. And the oil and gas extraction is dead last in, as a job creator out of 56 sectors in this province. For example, while those sectors account for one quarter of Alberta's GDP, they are only account for 7.5% of Alberta's jobs. So, you know, and, and you get five to seven times as many jobs in healthcare and in education for those million, for each million dollars that you invest. The transition off tar sands oil must start now. Otherwise, Alberta is going to be faced with a sudden end to export markets and the need to abruptly change to a post-carbon economy. And that would bring on a, de a depression with the wrenching and heartbreaking uh, uh, consequences that depressions bring. So we must develop a vision and a plan of what to do instead, and I'm going to end off on this. Um, what is that then? Well, the first step is to cap the, uh, the oil sands output at current levels and phase them out over 10 to 15 years um, with the oldest plants that have already uh, more than paid off their capital costs. At the same time, we have to uh, start new industries and jobs around a green economy that builds upon Alberta's highly educated and skilled workforce. We are much more, we have much more talent than just to be digging stuff out of the ground and sending it off. So what's, what is that vision and plan? Well, we know the main ingredients. Super insulate all homes and buildings, densify cities, stop urban sprawl, reorient uh, city transport around uh, transit, encourage much more telecommuting so it actually replaces real commuting, um, return to less energy intensive food production, the 100 mile diet for all, um, it all adds up to one thing, of course, the end of globalization in the sense of the death of distance. We also have to abandon the export mentality that we've had in this province the last century and start to produce mainly for the local and national market. Now, there are various routes to get to a post-carbon future have been offered. Some of them rely mainly on new technologies like hybrid cars, electric cars, wind, geothermal, solar power. Others count on changing behavior through market mechanisms like carbon taxes and putting a, a price on nature. None of these alternatives challenge business as usual capitalism with its underlying logic that the greed of each will lead to the greater good of all. That ever rising consumption helps the economy and leads to greater happiness. Well, those things in fact are not true and, really, and have to be challenged. The problem with these approaches is that they are unlikely to substantially cut carbon emissions anytime soon. Most run into the Jevons paradox that conservation of a resource can lead to its greater use. Now Jevons wrote in 1865 about the use of coal in England um, that technological improvements in the efficiency of coal use led ironically to greater coal consumption in a wide range of industries. Why? Because when many pe people conserve a fuel, its price falls. That stimulates greater use. Uh, build, if we build more efficient refrigerators, families buy two. We better insulate our homes, 
people supersize them. We need an historic paradigm shift and changes to our way of life, especially in the global north. And this is the route to a post-carbon future. In his book, The Great Turning, U.S. business and environmental writer David Corton adopts, and here I'm going to, you know, this is a philosophy cafe, so I'm going to, I didn't do much philosophy here, I'm not a philosopher, but I am going to go into a bit into Rousseau and, and Hobbes, I'm going to finish off on this. Um, okay, so Corton adopts a Jean-Jacques Rousseau model of that shift. He calls it Earth Community. Corton contrasts that with the current dominant model, which it basically comes from uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, whose main vision of human nature is a war of all against all. Now, the Corton uh, calls his vision, em uh, that uh, vision, empire, the, the present one. Instead of viewing, but he, he wants an alternative. Instead of viewing life as hostile and competitive like Hobbes, Corton's Earth model views it as supportive and cooperative. Humans are not flawed and dangerous, they have many possibilities. Order by dominant hierarchy is replaced by order through partnership. Compete or die becomes cooperate and live. Love life replaces love power. Defend the rights of the self is transformed into defend the rights of all. Masculine dominant becomes gender balanced. Rousseau summed up the Earth model best when he said 250 years ago, you are undone if you once forget that the fruits of the earth belonged to us all and the earth itself to nobody. Let's work together, change direction of Alberta and Canada, and steer clear of the buffalo jump. Well, there's a great deal to um, uh, discuss there and disagree with, I hope. And uh, so, um, as I said earlier, we are missing our roving mic. Okay, so, uh, when you uh, speak in the discussion, would you please make sure you speak up, and I'll be reminding people of that. Um, also, I'll try to keep some control on this so that um, uh, people who are talking uh, to the same sort of general topic uh, get a chance uh, before others. All right, so um, uh, otherwise I'm going to turn it over to Gordon and uh, he can call on people as they uh, raise their hands. Yeah, so let's uh, take uh, two or three comments or questions and then, um, you know, let's hear from you. I've been talking for quite a bit here, so it's your turn now. Yes. Well, I, I've been looking at this uh, peak oil business now for about three years, ever since I attended a, 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 a lecture at the Leduc uh, uh, Oil Museum there. And uh, I, I, it's amazing that none of our politicians, this, this is not a political issue, I'm asked, the question I'm really asking is, how and why do they keep these issues out of the public discourse. Okay. I, I can answer that in a minute. Is it, is that, you want me to do Okay, look, I'll go to that now. It is amazing that, that, that they do that. And you even get this, you look, look at that graph that I've produced there. Uh, the International Energy Agency, which um, uh, represents the 28 uh, industrial countries, is kind of the, the answer to OPEC they come out with uh, the world economic outlook, uh, the world energy outlook every year, and they predict uh, how much oil we have. And there was a, there was a Guardian story that uh, where that uh, uh, a couple of years ago, where they um, interviewed uh, some people who worked for the International Energy Agency. That's at the uh, OECD office in Paris. That's where the where it's uh, headquartered. And uh, these officials were saying we uh, that that the, uh, the International Energy Agency is coming out with more optimistic uh, 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 numbers on reserves than is, than is actually true, because the United States tells them that they must do that. Uh, they are worried that if people knew that, that we're going to suddenly run out of oil, the stock market would crash, there would be uh, economic panic, um, 
And of course, uh, I think the other reason is the, uh, the, uh, the our whole um, uh, economy, uh, um, vested interests, uh, in, in corp corporate vested interests, are based on the idea of growth. Uh, and they don't want to get off that. And they have a very short term idea, you know? What, are, what am I going to get in the next quarter? Am I going to show results? So if you start saying, you know, we, we can't continue to grow, um, it's going to be a challenge for the whole system. Uh, politicians have very, very short-term um, horizon as well. They're interested in the next election. Who is planning for the next generation? Who is planning for the long term? I am really outraged that this country has no plans for the next oil uh, shortage. All of the other countries in the International Energy Agency have strategic petroleum reserves. The United States has the biggest one, off in, the, off in Texas, in the, in the Gulf of Texas, in the salt caverns. And of course, they released some of that just, just a few months ago. Uh, Canada is re as reliant on oil imports as the United States is, and, and yet we have no strategic petroleum reserve. This country, you know, people could literally freeze in the dark. In Atlantic Canada, uh, half the people heat their homes uh, with oil uh, furnaces. Uh, Newfoundland, for example, ha produces enough oil of Atlantic Canada, yet Newfoundlanders don't get any Newfoundland oil. So if there's a shortage, they are, are, are incredibly vulnerable. Why don't they tell us about this thing? Because it, it would undermine the economic and political system, and they're very short. They got this very short range mentality. I wrote the National Energy Board a couple of years ago. National Energy Board was set up in 1959 to, to ensure security of supply for Canadians. That was their mandate. And I wrote them, I said, what studies have you done on energy security for Canadians? They wrote back and they said, we haven't done any. I, I think it's outrageous. And I think that Canadians should start demanding that our government do something. That's, and that's why I'm giving these talks, and, I, and I, you know, and a number of us are, are trying to get the, the, the word out there. We, we can't just, you know, can't just say, okay, let's just go along happily and then let it happen. I think there, we will see an end to growth. Inevitably. We have 7 billion people in the world. Yep. And uh, to me, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm old enough, I have grandchildren to worry about too, the same as everybody else. But really, it's, I'm not too concerned about ensuring that my gene pool continues on into the future. But I am curious about what's it going to be like when millions of people die? We, we get a little concerned when we see uh, uh, starvation in Africa and uh, I did some volunteer work for the Red Cross. People are personally incredibly generous when they see a disaster happen to 500,000 people or some, something. And, and, and I think they're tightening up. I think they're, they're becoming less generous. They feel the problem's too big. That's my opinion. And so, when that end to growth comes, I think there will be, not millions, there will be in the order of three billion people die. Now, if, if, if we're going to be sequestered with some rich capitalists who set the price of money, uh, may, maybe they'll protect us. Do you think that's possible? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. The rich capitalists are really concerned about us. Um, I mean, we, we live in an insane system. They, they, you know, you get the, the corporations will be, make, will be paying workers in Central America 10 or 15 cents an hour to make uh, running shoes or textiles or whatever. Uh, they'll be fouling the environment, especially in the global south. You know, Canada's got a lot of uh, things to answer for in Central and South America with its mining companies and employing... Uh, uh, Inco and in, in places like Guatemala and others, um, but uh, you know here they 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 um, 
uh, all of the, you know, the, the, the exploit workers, exploit the environment, get all this money, and then they be, they bet they bet it on on the total um, um, speculative investments that have no and trillions in profits go up in smoke. So here they have this system where you, you, you're trying to squeeze everything out of whatever worker there is, you're fouling the environment and you're not cleaning it up, and then suddenly you bet it on all the speculation and it's gone. You know, I mean, what an insane system, uh, you know, that we have. And, and I am worried, yes, um, I hope that three billion people will, will not die, but the you know, the, one of the problems with the, the climate change part, with um, uh, global warming, is that the people who are least responsible for it, those in the tropical regions, uh, who are in Africa, the, the emissions are not very high. Um, they are the ones who are going to suffer the most, and it is people in the temperate zones in the global north that are going to suffer the least. And the, they are the ones who have been putting up most of the emissions into the, the, our common biosphere. Um, yes, it's extremely important that we start to conserve now and start to move towards this transition so that we don't have the kind of disaster um, that you're talking about. Well, I, I think it makes a lot of sense, for example, just to build an enormous wall around Alberta. This is a metaphor, please. Uh, and what, what should happen, I think, is that we've got soil, we have a, a, my grand, both my grandparents homesteaded here. We, we, we can have gardens. We, we can produce enough fuel so that we can carry on. We can drive our vehicles. But just, just what is it that we get from the states when they send us this money, this funny money? What do we buy from them? I don't get it. Uh, uh, we, we've got water. We've got fuel. We've got uh, space to live. We could probably even build homes for young people getting married <laughs> and, and at a reasonable price. So why don't we do something like that? Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I think we should reorient towards the Alberta economy. I agree. Hi. Oh, hi, sorry. <laughs> so my question is, are there um, provinces or regions in Canada that up, are please. better positioned for this transition to non-fossil fuel energy, or are we all going to equally freeze in the dark? Okay, I don't know if everybody heard that, but uh, are there some provinces and regions in Canada that are better positioned for this transition than others? Yes, I would say, I mean, we are extremely lucky in this country. In the, in the, in the, see, I think the, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the energy transmission uh, means in the future is going to be electricity. Electricity, uh, I, we've got to get off carbon fuels, and uh, if we can produce that electricity from non-fossil fuels, I think that's going to be the future. Now, we're extremely lucky in this country. We produce 60% of our electricity from hydropower. Now, I know that dams, when you actually dam a river, it, it, and you push off native people, there are a lot of incredibly negative uh, impacts. But once you have those, and I don't advocate building more of them, I think if you're going to build more dams, they should be run of the river dams. Uh, they've got to make, let the species go through, not the huge flooding of areas. But we produce more hydroelectricity in this country than the United States does, and we, and they, we have one tenth the population. So we get 60 percent of our of our of electricity from hydropower. The United States gets six percent. Only Norway and Iceland actually produce more uh, hydroelectricity per capita than we do. So we've got a great base to have uh, uh, an alternative um, electricity system. We can add in wind and solar and geothermal and all those other things. But we need a national e-grid. Quebec, here, here are the great hydro producing provinces, Newfoundland, Labrador, Quebec, Manitoba, British Columbia. We should put all of this into a national e-grid instead of uh, exporting it. Uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan, you know, Alberta could get some of its electricity. Here we produce almost all of our electricity from coal and gas, which have all of these emissions. We just built Keep Hills, you know, coal-fired plant. Um, 
we should be getting um, electricity from British Columbia, Saskatchewan uh, from Manitoba, um, Ontario from Manitoba and Quebec, uh, and Newfoundland if they could get out of that awful deal with Quebec that they signed in the uh, late uh, 1967, uh, could supply all of Atlantic Canada with high, you know, and, and then you can add in all of the, the wind source. So this is going to be the energy source of the future, electricity, and we've got to do it through, with non-fossil fuels. And those provinces are the best, but I think we've got to make it national. Hi Gordon, I really enjoyed your, your talk. Thanks a lot for coming. I just had a, a very quick observation to make. About a year ago, there was a flurry of diplomatic interest in the, in the oil sands. I remember Nancy Pelosi went to Ottawa at the time she was still the Democratic Speaker of the House. And Lindsay, Lindsay Graham actually, as you may recall, did a flyover and maybe even a stopover in uh, Fort McMurray, and he was at that time uh, not only a senator, but chairman, I think, of the U.S. Military Procurement, Procurement Committee in Washington. And the thing that surprised me about his interview with the Edmonton Journal was that Lindsey Graham um, was very explicit in saying that the oil sands production for us is very important, particularly for the U.S. military. He made a very specific point, which kind of surprised me about that. And I kind of got to thinking um, that the US, of course, recently, a few years ago, it tried unsuccessfully to launch a coup against Chavez in Venezuela in the 1950s. Of course, they overthrew Mossadegh in Iran and replaced him with the Shah. They overthrew Salvador Allende, that was more for Coca, perhaps, in Chile, for Anaconda and Calicut, and so on and so forth. And it strikes me that the issue isn't simply self-sufficiency of the U.S., because you've made the valid point that sources of proven oil reserves, conventional oil reserves in the U.S. are more than enough to supply the country. But it's always seemed to me that given the structure of U.S. imperialism and monopoly, capitalist control and oligopolistic control of the oil sector, that the bigger strategic interest that the U.S. government and its oil companies have isn't simply energy self-sufficiency, but it is global control of supply of oil. And that's why they were so interested in uh, the leases which became available in Iraq after the invasion. That's why they're so interested in Libya. It's not energy self-sufficient, it's simply. It's global control of the actual supply of oil to China, uh, to other, other countries uh, within the industrialized regions of the, the world. So. That continues to bother me. I, I don't mean this as a very negative, uh, pessimistic view. I, the very fact that we may really be facing the possibility of US retaliation if we don't uh, comply, I, that's not a reason to bow down and become craven. I, I wouldn't say that for a minute, but I kind of would want a more realistic assessment of the possibilities of US either military or uh, industrial and commercial retaliation because the 1970s was one thing but we live in a post 9-11 world in which all forms of security to the US have become vastly more important and we're not even talking about water because I think water constitutes a far greater threat to Canadian sovereignty than oil does in the long run. Just a thought. Could you sort of just sum that up for <laughs> So not everybody heard that? So uh, the, the point was that um, uh, the United States uh, is an empire that is not only concerned with getting oil for itself, but with controlling uh, the world's supply of oil. Uh, this includes uh, Libya now and, uh, you know, back to Mossadegh in 1953 and all of those things where the coups they've had. And, where, and, and also water in Canada, and, and where, do, where does this leave Canada? What is a realistic assessment of what the United States would do if Canada, say, followed the course that I have advocated? Is, I think, have I summed it up reasonably well? Yeah, well, I, mean, I agree with everything you say, you're saying. That is, uh, that is a real problem. Um, the, uh, the U.S. has, uh, you know, 
uh, thought that uh, somehow uh, oil in some other country is their oil uh, rather than uh, under the sovereign uh, control of the people of, of that country. And yes, uh, but does this mean that Canada should not, you know, what does this mean? Uh, are, would they retaliate if Canada phased out the tar sands and phased out uh, oil exports? Uh, there is um, there is a possible, you know, I think before military invention in Canada, uh, intervention in Canada, and I think that is not all that likely, is that they would do economic retaliation or try that. Of course, I mean, if we started to move towards um, uh, a Canada first energy security and sustainable strategy, uh, you would get, of course, uh, the Alberta government representing the transnational oil companies with threat and separation. Uh, you would start to, they would start to work on all kinds of internal uh, dissent within and including the whole huge, uh, the media and the, uh, the corporations within Canada. Many of those are foreign owned. Of course, Fox News and all of these media would, you know, would be talking about all those commies in Canada and what they were doing and there'd be all of that. Um, so, I mean, I I'm, I'm, don't underestimate the challenge of, of what we would have to do. But it is instructive that in the 1970s, and, there, and the, you know, I mean, I know it was before uh, September 11th, but the U.S. was very concerned with uh, uh, oil security. I mean, everybody, you know, going, going back to Winston Churchill in 1910, uh, moving uh, the British Navy over to oil, oil has been, since in the last century, the key um, energy source for, to uh, power up the military. Uh, and that was true in the 70s as well. I think what we have to do in Canada, and, and so, but the United States did not, you know, I, th I think if we put it in the same terms that the Americans have. The Americans have a national oil policy. They have uh, their 2005 act is, uh, 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 law is uh, about energy security and energy independence. I think we should adopt the same terminology. Uh, when you put, when you talk about uh, energy security for an empire, what it means is grabbing someone else's oil. What it means for uh, an energy satellite is it means tr gaining, re regaining control of your own oil. So it has the same terminology, has in, uh, totally opposite meanings. Um, so I think what you, what you put it in, you don't say, we're going to cut you off oil. What you say is, we cannot green the tar sands. That, is, that has been shown that you, there is so much energy, so much natural gas has to be, all of the reasons. We, what we're going to do is we're going to impose on the tar sands very tough environmental regulations. And if you can live up to the same environmental footprint as conventional oil, fine, go ahead. If you can't meet that, you are going to be phased out. So you, and then you say, we are going to bring back what we had in, in, uh, before the free trade agreement, and natural gas, 25 years of supply for Canada before we export. So if you can meet those conditions of non-fracked conventional oil, fine. We will then export any surpluses in the United States. So you put it in exactly the same terms. Now, yes, the United States uh, and, and the military, they would react strongly to this. But the United States is a global uh, a player. It is not just a continental player. The, the United States strategy, because they, they don't want to deal, they don't want to actually power down and, and live off their own oil, even though they could get twice as much per capita as the rest of the world if they use their own oil, um, uh, is that the, um, is, is the diversity of supply. So they're going into Africa, they're going into many countries, and their idea is we're not going to rely on one country, we're not just going to rely on Canada, we're not just going to rely on Mexico. We are going to we're going to diversify our imports, uh, and so if Canada said over the next 15 years we are going to phase this out, uh, and for these reasons, that would not be, end the American Empire. And I think uh, you know it, it sure would be a huge political battle. I doubt that it will there will be an invasion, um, and um, you know I think that you can scare Canadians as well into saying, oh, we couldn't do that because the Americans wouldn't allow it.
on the day that Alberta is electing a, a new premier, okay. could you give us your synopsis of where you think the various uh, political groups ally on, on your vision? <laughs> Well, I would like to say, now I don't know on oil that there's a big difference between Alison Redford and Gary Marr. Um, there is in health care, but, uh, but on oil I'm not sure. Um, so I'm not going to predict who's going to win that race. We'll know within a few hours anyways, unless... Does anybody know when the vote's going to come in? Um, I would say that no uh, uh, major political party in Alberta agrees with my vision. Uh, I would say the ones that are closest, of course, are the New Democrats. But I think the New Democrats and the Peter Lougheed vision are almost the same thing. Um, and that vision is, and I used to hold this up until a few years ago, which was, you know, for well over a century, starting back with John A. MacDonald uh, in the 19th century, you know, uh, our first prime minister said we should no longer be uh, hewers of wood and drawers of water, that we can actually develop industry and do all of that. So let us upgrade, let us cut back. Now, this, this is the Lougheed and the New Democrat uh, position, basically. Um, let us uh, um, slow down uh, the tar sands and let's upgrade and refine it all here so we're not going to export jobs. Um, and so that's upgrading the resource. And, and and so I mean I always you know I used to say all of these things like let's produce a lot less energy but let's get way more value added for each unit of energy. I now think that uh, that that is not environmentally viable. Uh, the upgraders and refineries uh, produce incredible uh, emissions and uh, the uh, fouling of the water and it. it, it I think, and, and the idea of just upgrading, I mean, that isn't even getting into manufacturing. All of that is, is what they call primary manufacturing, or just upgrading a resource before you export. I, you know, we have a very educated population here. We have people who can do high tech. We, we should be thinking of a new kind of economy. Uh, I know you can't just put that in right away. You have to, you start, have to start developing a plan. Even that, that green strategy I talked about in the speech is just, all of that is talking about this a transition. You, you build a high-speed train, you build it once. So those are construction jobs. But you have to build a long-term economy that is going to be using way less uh, uh, energy inputs. Um, so I'm afraid that uh, even for the New Democrats, um, uh, you know, uh, so their vision is very, very much like uh, Peter Light's, maybe with a little stronger um, um, union uh, and uh, 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 blue-collar worker, you know, kind of orientation. But uh, I think we have to, whether that's politically viable in, in Alberta, what I'm talking about right now. I mean, I, I can, I can understand if you go to the doorstep with what I'm talking about now. You would, you, would, you would be in trouble. But I think we have to build this idea and perhaps other political parties, New Democrats, Liberals, Greens. Um, I don't, you know, Wild Rose Alliance, definitely not. <laughs> uh, hard to see the Conservatives, too, taking that. Do you know what uh, if it's possible to drop out of NAFTA and what would be the implication? Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, the interesting thing about the proportionality clause is that it, it, it's put into universal type language, but it only applies to Canada. So here we got three countries in NAFTA. Mexico said, no way. We're not going to sign this. That we, we would give up our oil sovereignty. So Mexico has an exemption. So, but this also means not only Mexico has an exemption, but the United States exports natural gas to Mexico, but because Mexico has an exemption, the United States doesn't have to export the same proportion of natural gas uh, to Mexico. It doesn't really apply to the, to the United States either because the United States doesn't export oil or, na or natural gas. So it does, certainly doesn't export oil. Uh, so it only applies to Canada. Um, now, uh, it's interesting, in the 88 election, the, the free trade agreement, both the Liberals and the Democrats were against the free trade agreement, and they got more than 50% of the vote when you added their votes together. 
In the 1993 election, that was the next election for the Liberals after the 88 election, Jean Chrétien ran on a platform of renegotiating NAFTA because Mulroney had negotiated NAFTA. It was in late October 1993, that election, and NAFTA was going to come into effect in January 1st, 19, 1994. The Liberals ran and they won. You remember that they won fairly big because the Conservatives went down from 170 seats to two in that election, if you remember that. Um, and so what the Liberals said was, we should get the same deal on energy as the Mexicans have, which basically was uh, an exemption from proportionality. He had the mandate. He could have done that. What, the, what NAFTA says is that any party can leave within giving six months notice and they're out. Now if you remember in the Democratic, uh, the great battle for the Democratic primary uh, between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, uh, when it hit Ohio in uh, March of 2008, there was a lot, I guess a lot of people in Ohio, a lot of workers, blue collar workers, had lost manufacturing jobs to Mexico. So there was opposition to NAFTA. So, in that uh, debate in, in Ohio, Hillary Clinton said, we, uh, we should renegotiate NAFTA, and we've got to make sure that we get better, stronger labor and environmental standards put into that. Barack Obama went even further, and he said, we have to use the trigger of the six-month clause. That was his phrase. The trigger of the six-month clause is say, either they, that we uh, renegotiate NAFTA or we're out of it. Now, so if the, you know this has been raised publicly that you can get out of NAFTA if you can't re you know, renegotiate, that I think what Canada should be doing. We may have to wait till 2015 so we can get a different government than the Harper government. I can't see the Harper government doing this, um, but is to say we need the Mexican exemption in NAFTA. Mexico is part of NAFTA. They are not subject to this uh, onerous deal. We should not be either. Why? That's unfair. So if you bring that to Canadians, now I don't think we're going to any a government would succeed in doing that. So the Americans say no, but after go, going through that process, you, you process and you say, okay, let's leave NAFTA if we cannot renegotiate it. I would put it in that. I, I don't think it, it. I wouldn't go to people saying let's get out of NAFTA. I would say this, you know, proportionality. We, we cannot take control of our own resources and our own climate emissions unless we change that, and we're going to demand a change within NAFTA, and then go through that process. Thank you. I'd like to pick up on what you were saying just, just before that last question about the uh, question, the, the reorientation of the Alberta economy. If we're going to wind down the oil industry, I think there's a very, very strong case that that's what we should be doing. Where are we going? You, you've mentioned that we have a lot of educated people, but so do other places. Uh, is there something that Alberta could do that isn't oil? That probably agriculture, I, that, that won't run away, but what else? Well, that, that's a very good question, and uh, I don't have as many answers uh, as I would like. Now, I, you know, when I talk about uh, phasing out the tar sands, I'm not talking about phasing out conventional oil or conventional natural gas. So now these are would be are on decline. So they, but they would still be there for the next uh, couple of decades. Um, I think that we should be going into. Um, helping to pioneer some of the new uh, alternative forms of energy. There are uh, deep geothermal uh, in, in, under Alberta and under um, uh, the Northwest Territories and Yukon, um, and we should be, with our drilling technology, with our knowledge from the oil industry, this would be a natural thing for Alberta to be getting into. And not only for itself, but uh, to get an expertise in this, that it, that it could also export that expertise. Um, there, there are probably other things, maybe wind. I mean, we're, we're actually fairly well set up for wind, uh, especially in Lethbridge area. <laughs> Looking from 
of people from Lethbridge here. Um, but and, and, but there, I, what, the reason I lack knowledge of this, I would love to have, I would like to put together a conference, a symposium of people who actually are thinking about There's so few of us who are thinking about reorienting the economy. I was in a conversation with some people in the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, BC, and they were talking about reorienting the, the BC economy. And so they had about 25 people from all the different sectors talking about what, what BC could do. We need that conversation in Alberta. Uh, we have not had, since the Europeans first settled uh, in um, Alberta, we've always had this export orientation, right? We built this wheat economy that was going to be exported abroad, you know, and then we, then we get into oil. We have to start thinking about uh, relocalizing, uh, as this gentleman said before, we have the resources, we have the things at home to be doing that, but I don't have a full answer for you. Anybody else on what the uh, economic alternatives are? Uh, if we go off of yeah. I, don't, I don't think I have anything new to say, just to remind us that a certain Mr. Dion already suggested this to us, and it is apparently true now that the Germans are ahead. We don't know about the Chinese or the Indians with regard to non-petroleum uh, products. We will have to start buying them from them. We might be too late already. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I understand. Are you saying we're going to have to buy petroleum products from... Non-petroleum. Non-petroleum from Germany and China. There was a lady in Alberta last week, I believe. Yes, from, from Germany. Yes. Yeah, well, they, they in, in Germany have really gotten into alternative forms of energy. And yes, uh, they and, and Denmark and other places are, are quite a bit ahead. Uh, we would have to find some niche. We may have to import some of that technology. But, you know, we, this is something that, that, that we, we actually, uh, this is still a rich economy. And we're still going to be getting, and the possibility of getting, greater economic surpluses from the, even the existing oil we have, we should be putting that into planning the new economy, the new mainly post-carbon economy. Uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Gordon. There's, a, of course, an enormous amount of uh, material that I agree with in your thing, but I, uh, in your talk, uh, and I'll, I'll love uh, I'd like to make two points about uh, what I, I think we have to do to meet the challenge that you've uh, laid out. And the, the first point is I, I think that on a scientific basis we have to meet the challenge of what the other side is saying. For instance, the uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency in the United States has evidently certified the Keystone Pipeline plans regarding the Ogala Aquifer and notwithstanding that our uh, Maud Barlow is uh, being arrested on Parliament Hill because of the potential destruction of that uh, aquifer, according to what? Uh, that, that it's pretty hard to answer that case. Another example before my other point is the uh, tar sands uh, uh, producers, they are apparently moving in quite a rapid direction towards uh, reducing the, uh, you know, the tailings ponds impacts, let alone for the in situ production. But today's Edmonton Journal, for example, having the piece on the uh, consolidation of the tailings, you know, a rapid means of doing that for restoring the damage. And uh, the, the, the use of water is far less today than it was five years ago. And I, 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 uh, I'd like to hear what you have to say about getting with it with respect to a actually answering the, uh, the case, you know? Uh, from the case from the other side. Uh, and said, my uh, other point on this is that I, I think that uh, as these changes uh, come about, you know, like some, some are, are going to be under the uh, uh, control of uh, our politics, our opposition, our, our push for these things, uh, but we shouldn't neglect that there should have to be parallel developments within the empire, uh, the empire to the south 
itself. You know, uh, to the de to the degree that uh, we are aware in Canada that global warming uh, is the you know uh, a phenomenon that's going to cause tremendous damage. I don't think the elimination of humanity, but uh, you know. Uh, there are, there are uh, tens of thousands, if not billions, in the United States as well that, that know what the stakes are. Uh, I, I think uh, to some degree when you're presenting a, a case for what could be called Canadian autarky, you know, stopping the oil exports to the, uh, the south unless certain conditions are met, that uh, it, it, the scenario neglects what will probably historically unfold uh, in the United States as well. So perhaps your comment on that idea as well. Okay. Very good. Uh, good uh, profound questions. Well, I, you know, I, I think that the um, uh, I'm in tune with the environmental movement and progressive movement in the United States in this, uh, which uh, pretty well around the world, people are talking about relocalizing, renationalizing economies. And that you have to live on your own ecosystem and uh, your own, don't exceed your, your own footprint. Uh, you know, and it is environmentalists in the United States who are trying to stop the export of, of uh, uh, tar sands oil uh, through them. And they see themselves as victims, and they, but they also see it as a wider thing of helping humanity, which is if Alberta cannot get the, the uh, tar sands oil out of Alberta, they cannot, you know, the, 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 the production cannot increase. Uh, so I think they're motivated, people in Nebraska and elsewhere, uh, Bill McKibben, uh, McKibben and the 350 and all the people, brave people who were arrested in Washington last month, are, I, I, would, I see what I'm talking about in solidarity with, with what they're talking about. I don't, I don't see, because I think I do think, you know, we're talking about the end of the age of, uh, the end of globalization, of death of distance with the end of cheap oil. Uh, countries are going to have to go back, and that's to uh, uh, living largely on their own resources. I don't think we have a, I don't think we have a choice about that, because we're not going to be able to move all that material stuff around the world. Uh, you know, I do think that the richer countries should still have an obligation to help the poorer ones. I'm a strong internationalist. I'm not. I'm not just. Um, you know, I'm not trying to build a firewall around Alberta or Canada. Um, I. You know, so I, I, I'm a strong internationalist there. Um, on the question of, of uh, meeting uh, what the industry is doing, that perhaps they're greening the uh, tar sands uh, using less water. The the you talked about the. Uh, um, uh, tailing ponds being, uh, I call them toxic lakes, um, being, uh, you know, um, reduced. Um, look, I think you bring in low um, carbon fuel standards like California's talked about, and then you say, look, if you can meet these conditions, then fine. But, but you know, I, look, if, if I don't have anything uh, you know, against the tar sands per se. If the tar sands could be produced with as little uh, uh, ecological f uh, footprint to lower it as conventional oil, non frac conventional, I'd say go ahead and do it. But everything I've seen is that it cannot be done. Because, I mean, that stuff, you know, there's a big argument. Is this tar or is this oil sands, right? Well, I, I, you know, it, 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 uh, uh, my answer to that is, look, it was used for hundreds of years by native people, you know, to, to uh, fix the leaks in their canoes. And what would you put on your leak? Would you put oil on it or, or tar to patch a hole? Um, but, um, you know, the stuff doesn't run. I mean, the thing is that you have to heat it up. And you have to use energy. We have to. We are running down natural gas in this province, and we're using close to a third of the natural gas here. We have less than 10 years supply of natural gas in Alberta, and we're using close to a third of it to heat the, this uh, this uh, off this uh, the bitumen, so we can export the United States. What are people going to be doing in 20 or 30 years to heat their homes in this province? You know, we get down to the minus 30s here. 
Um, it, it, you know, there's, there is a matter of survival. So what are you going to use this incredibly uh, valuable resource for? Um, it's insane to be using it for this dirty form of oil. Um, but, you, so you put out those environmental, you know, if, if, if companies can meet that, fine. I mean, I would put it in those terms. I, from everything I've read, even if they are reducing the amount of water they're using and reducing the tailing spawns, it is still uh, an incredible, it is still dirty oil. The final thing is on Nebraska, the uh, Ogala Aquifer, the reason why people are worried is that, and, and the actual, the first Keystone pipeline, this is a, the Keystone XL, uh, the, the first Keystone went, went through a couple of years ago and went through a, a part of Nebraska. And the reason people, the, people didn't even notice and they do now, one was the, the BP spill in the Gulf. The second was that the entire, the, is that pipelines uh, broke in, in uh, uh, Michigan and started fouling the water there. Um, and, and then you've had, uh, of course, there was that crazy thing of uh, the big tar sands companies bringing uh, equipment made in uh, Korea through uh, Washington State and Montana and going through some of the most pristine country and people blocking. So it became a, a, an American issue. And people are worried. And of course, the other thing is fracking, is you've got this hydraulic fracturing of shale oil and gas which is fouling the water, you know, in Wyoming and in New York State and in Pennsylvania and all of these places. So people are, you know, people are able to, when they turn on the tap, they can light the stuff and it, it, it comes on fire instead of actually getting water out of there. So there is a, a great rising awareness in, in the United States. It's, and, you know, um, this is incredibly dry prairie land you're talking about. And if you don't have access to, to the water that's under the ground, there is not the, the viability of human communities there. I think we're going to have. I think we're, uh, we're going to have to break, uh, take our break. Just one small comment. Okay. Is it true that they are reducing the amount of energy and water used per barrel? But you can only go down, say, 2 or 3 percent. If the production increases by 25 percent, you screwed up all the gain you've made because you're still producing way more. The, and, and this is one of the advertising features from the petroleum producing people. We are green in the, in the country, sure. Uh, 5 percent reduction per barrel, but I produce two barrels more than I was a year ago. So. Absolutely. I agree with you. Yes. It's a misrepresentation, and they use a statistic to prove a point that doesn't exist. All right. Um, uh, that was a very vigorous discussion. I think it's time for a break here and uh, get some more refreshment, and uh, then we'll come up for uh, come back for a uh, wrap up. Okay, well that was uh, lively and really good, um, and this is the kind of discussion I think we need, so I'm just going to throw it open to you people again, you've, you've heard me. Um, I'm a little bit confused about your stand on uh, uh, going local. From what you described initially, you talked about, you know, centralizing um, transportation, having public transport, and um, compacting the world in a more local sense. And so I was thinking that what that really hints of is increased urbanization. You're against urban sprawl, but by the same token, uh, you can use less energy in one sense if you, if you have highly urbanized centers. However, if you empty the farm side, the farmland, take people out of the farmland, what you're leaving the farmland to is Cargill. And Cargill in itself represents another interesting problem. Um, and its other ilk. Uh, so, in, in some ways, it seems to me 
that really de-urbanization or ruralization would, would be a better way to go. But, you know, in, can, you, can you take out on that? Yeah, sure. I, well, I'll try and square that circle. Um, Did everybody hear that? Does anybody not hear what you said? Uh, I could hear here. You heard it? Well, uh, I guess what I would support is more urbanization and more ruralization and less suburbanization. So, um, what we're saying, what I'm saying, is in the cities, the reason why Britain they actually use 40 percent as much oil per capita as we do in North America, and they have a similar stand. Well, they have much more dense cities. They, they built a lot of their cities before the age of the automobile. And so they've got great public transit. They've got, you need an, a density to have for public transit to work. Uh, and so I'm saying stop urban sprawl into the farmlands. Let's keep our farmland. But I'm also saying if we go back to the 100 mile diet, and I guess I didn't go into this very much, and relocalizing agriculture, if you start to get off as much use of, of uh, fossil fuels in agriculture and fertilizers, um, we're going to have to have a higher population doing the farming than we do at present. Uh, what we've done is we've replaced a lot of labor on the farms with fossil fuel, with cheap oil. And if we're going to go back to local and, you know, organic farming, I think is just basically the kind of farming that we did 50 years ago. <laughs> yeah, that was our that was our food system, right? Before the, the cargos and all of the uh, the new uh, you know the, the big uh, transnational started to, to run things. Um, so what I'm saying is yes, I think we're actually going to need more farmers, uh, be, uh, and we're going to need denser where we have cities, denser cities. And what I'm saying is we don't need more suburbs; we need fewer suburbs. And what we do with the present suburbs is we have to try and, instead of continuing to allow that urban sprawl, densify those, and there are a different way we can talk about how to do that, whether you have granny flats uh, you know, in, the, in the backyard or, or rent out a place or have some apartment buildings along major corridors or whatever, and being able to walk instead of having, anyways. There, uh, you know, we, there are real problems of how you take the suburbs, what they're going to do with the end of the age of cheap oil. Uh, we used to, in our old agriculture, we used to take solar power. The sun would produce with our crops three times as much energy in the, in the food as uh, as the humans put into it. So this now what we do is we have a fossil fuel-based agriculture where we put 10 units of fossil fuel energy in to get one unit of food energy out. And that is no longer viable. Um, so, I, you know, I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm against, uh, the continue, you know, continue to expand the suburbs. Not, I'm not saying that people should move out of uh, the rural areas, the, the farming. Yeah. Um, how do you feed a city of, say, 5 to 10 million people, you know, which is no longer considered that, you know, it's sort of a regular large city, uh, having a 100-mile... Well, you know, look, I, I, I won't say that my expertise is in farming, but what a lot of people are talking about, they did this in Cuba and they're doing it in other places, is you do uh, a lot of uh, urban farming. You actually grow some of your food in the cities. Uh, Britain did this in the Second World War very quickly. Uh, Britain had, you know, uh, it, it, they used to say at the beginning of the Second World War that Britain could feed itself on the weekend and it had to import all the food for the rest of the, from Monday to Friday. Well, you had these German U-boats out there that were, of course, uh, trying to sink all those supplies going to Britain. Um, and so they, and very quickly, within a few years, they encouraged all of these urban gardens. And people were farming in their backyards. They had, they had commons where people could farm. And they actually produced 
within a few years, 10% of their food from, from those sources. Um, Cuba went through uh, just a crash diet of, uh, for years they were supplied by the Soviets with uh, um, cheap oil. They didn't have oil, so they went through the usual farming thing of a, of a fossil fuel based agriculture, uh, you know, relying on oil and fertilizers and all that. Suddenly, of course, the Soviet Union collapsed in, in 1991. No more subsidies. The Cubans went, and within a couple of years, they were down to eating one meal a day. Uh, they were getting about 1,700 calories a day. They, you know, just enough to eat. People went back to bicycles. People started farming. They're doing a lot of urban farming in food production in Havana and in the city. So you actually grow a lot of your vegetables and food, and you keep chickens and stuff in the city. Um, and so you do, and that means you, there, there is no, you, not only do you get fresh food, but you don't have all of those transportation costs. Uh, and if we, for example, went for the 100 mile diet, say around Edmonton, instead of producing all this stuff for export, farming would be reoriented to the farmers, you know, kind of thing like the farmer's market, but expanded on a scale of maybe 10 times that, where uh, most of the farming is uh, oriented towards supplying that, that, that big city and having a, a close connection between the farmers and the consumers and actually developing that relation. I think it's really important for it to develop a sense of responsibility and of responsibility towards nature that people and f that con the consumer, the food consumers and the producers actually know each other. So you can't get away with doing terrible agricultural practices that, that, that foul the land halfway around the world where you don't know what's going on. I'd like to, to introduce a little bit of a contrarian note here. Um, I mean, um, you talk, Gordon, as though um, you know we could politically um, start this process of uh, what did you call it? Uh, turning down. What, what was the what was the title? Po powering down. Powering down. Um, uh, in a, in a kind of deliberate fashion. Um, whereas, I mean, the, the examples that you give, for example, of uh, Britain and Cuba, who did have to power down, are examples where it was forced upon them, right, by, uh, in the one case, the uh, Second World War, and in the other case, by the uh, interruption of all their petroleum supplies from the Soviet law. So um, I don't quite see this uh, happening until actually the crisis hits. That is that uh, all of a sudden we find that um, fossil fuels are becoming very expensive, um, that uh, a lot of the uh, industries that we have are no longer viable, a lot of the ways in which we live are no longer viable, um, and, um, and then uh, it will be useful, of course, to have people like yourself um, available with ideas about how to cope with this, with this sort of situation. But as a, as a deliberate political program at this juncture, I don't see it. Uh, a great question. Did everybody hear that? Um, well, I think in terms of real politics, uh, I think there has to be a combination between ideas, this kind of event where you getting out a different vision and, and, uh, and talking about solution, solutions and, and moving in a different direction, and crises. Now this can happen more on peak oil, on the end of, of cheap oil, and I think we're going to see that very, very soon than on climate change. So I think that when the first uh, oil shortage happens and people in eastern Canada are adversely affected, 
and they will be adversely affected very, very quickly within a matter of a few days. There was, uh, I don't know if remember, anybody remembers in, um, in Britain, uh, there was um, uh, a kind of um, uh, strike by the uh, truck drivers, this is in uh, 2000, uh, where, and, and the oil companies were in um, um, cahoots with this uh, to bring down the petrol tax in, in Britain. There was a shortage of oil and within, that w w lasted for about a week, within a few days, you know, hospitals couldn't operate, schools couldn't operate, uh, the, the, st uh, the stores didn't have enough food, people, there was a run on food, I mean, very, it was just a, like a, so we are so dependent on oil. If you suddenly cut off uh, supplies like the, and there was some of this in the 70s in, in Canada and in Eastern Canada, um, then people would very quickly demand that their government do something. Uh, and I, so I think there's going to be a combination of those, I think we're going to see a series of those crises. not going to be like peak oils, like we get up to maximum production and then we're going to fall off a cliff. I'm not going to do that. It's going to be uh, a gradual reduction and then there's going to be, that's going to lead to uh, a, a recession depression. Uh, or like in 2008 when the oil got up to $147 a barrel in July 2008, that and the, the housing bubble and speculative thing in the United States were the cause of the Great Recession. So we're, we're going to see, and then I think it's when a majority of people think we can't carry on the way we have. It's only under those circumstances that a majority of people will start to look to the ideas, kind of the ideas I'm talking about here. But it's important that we get as large a number of people that understand this and start spreading this idea so that when the crisis happens, then you have enough people who can spread this word out uh, to people to say, here is a solution. This was a problem they didn't even know they had. And here, now it's gonna be much harder on climate change. The problem with that is the people who are causing the climate change, as I said before, in the global north, are not experiencing the most, but the biggest problem is that the worst effects are going to be in 40 or 50 years or a generation or two away from the action we do today. So to what extent are, you know, it's going to be our grandchildren, uh, children and grandchildren are going to be having the negative effects. To what extent is that going to mobilize uh, opinion today? That it, that. That, that's a, more of a, now, if you start to get more Hurricane Katrinas and you start to get more uh, disasters, I, I'm afraid that it's very hard to mobilize enough people to really demand this stuff and to say we're going to make changes until they start to see crises. Um, so I think it's going to be a combination of ideas, movements with crises that are, is going to actually start to turn the tide. Had a, I just had a question about um, about localism and uh, internationalism. Um, uh, I, because it seemed to me your your advice concerning, um, I guess, uh, you know, what is best for you know um, for sustenance. Uh, and you had a very sort of localist focus uh, there, you know. Um, but but um, at the same time, you also mentioned you know you you're a bit of an internationalist as well. So, um, where and with internationalists, you know, I uh, took it to mean what is kind of good for humanity as a whole. So, so I'm just wondering, you know, there seems to be that a bit of a struggle between um, localism, you know, what is particular, and internationalism versus holistic. I, I'm just interested in how that struggle can. What are your views on sort of uh, how that struggle, you know, can be worked out? Well, I mean, it's, uh, that's a big question and a very good question. Did everybody hear that? Um, I think there's a difference between the local global perspective and the sovereignty internationalism perspective. Now, let me tell you, so the, the, the globalization idea is that uh, we're going to get rid of borders, the, the, the borderless world. Um, 
we are uh, we're going to get rid of nations and nationalisms and all of that thing. And so there's the, the global corporate elite, and we're going to have a global citizens movement, regardless of borders, that are going to rise up and challenge that. And it's going to be on behalf of all humanity. Well, the, the uh, other view is that it's actually important to still have a popular sovereignty because I, we don't have democracy beyond the level of countries. We don't have enough <coughs> democracy anywhere within countries, but we certainly don't have democracy beyond uh, countries. And so the idea, I, I, have, I have trouble with the idea of global citizenship and the idea that you can actually be an actor that has influence uh, at the level of seven billion people. I think a globalized world is the perfect uh, opportunity for uh, global elites to manipulate and to play off one group of people against another. I was in uh, uh, Porto Alegre, uh, Brazil at the World Social Forum in 2005, and I was in uh, a meeting that was talking about South American integration. And they had uh, a number of ministers there, and they were all, they were white men in, in uh, jackets and ties, and some of these guys were radicals, they might have even been the head of the Communist Party of one of these countries or other. And then there was a, 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 a black man uh, without a tie, and he started off singing uh, a cappella instead of giving a talk. Uh, and this was, uh, I later learned, an incredible voice, this guy was the Minister of Culture of Brazil. His name was uh, uh, Gilberto Gil, who was an incredible popular singer. He said, what we have to do is we have to think of two ideas at the same time, and one doesn't sacrifice the other. We have to have the popular sovereignty of all peoples, and we have to, uh, we have to work for the, the common good of all humanity, both at the same time, not one um, at the expense of the other. Um, and so he talked about the, um, the importance of uh, South, uh, South American countries working together to, in order to get sovereignty from the American empire, uh, but also the popular sovereignty within each country to do as much as, to have that, the, as much um, uh, control, national local control as possible. So that, that is my, I consider myself to be an internationalist popular sovereignty and popular national and local sovereignty rather than a globalist, either from below, uh, even uh, as uh, from below. So that is, is my view of it. Well, this is a slightly frivolous question. If, would you entertain frivolous questions? Well, why not? I mean, let's have a good laugh. Well, okay. <laughs> uh, a little while ago, my broker asked me, in terms of investing in the stock market, what I thought about the tar sands. And I said, I think we shouldn't be doing them. Don't put any of my money there. Uh, so then the question arises, where do you put your money? I have a few suggestions, okay. which I have not carried out, of course. Uh, but, um, and, and they are slightly from us, but maybe not completely. One is high-tech greenhouses, because we don't grow bananas in Alberta. We don't have enough global warming yet. We don't have enough global warming yet. Maybe it will come. Uh, and uh, if you think back to what bananas meant in Britain in about 1945, you know, this was a this was a gap, and, um, so we've we've got to start thinking about that. I would put some money into high tech sailing ships. Uh, they did experiment, I I believe. There there have been one or two pilot projects on this, uh, and um, I, I, it seems to me that's a that's a good idea. I would probably also put some money into uh, lighter than aircraft that could be. They might take longer, but they would use less fuel to get goods from one place the, to another. The old blimps, but make them safer. Exactly so. Yeah. Just, just that. Uh, am I uh, am I going to make money? And have you any further ideas on how to do this? Well, um, it could be all hot air, but no. <laughs> uh, 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 I'm not very good at investing, but I think all of those are, are good ideas of, of things to do. 
Um, yes, we have to be moving in those directions. But whether you can make money on it, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to give that advice. I have <laughs> no idea. <laughs> it, it does seem to me that there is a, is a sort of a need for um, some sort of a conference of experts in technology and economics um, to come together and say what sorts of technologies, what sorts of industries are going to be viable in an economy where fossil fuels are very expensive. Um, uh, and, uh, but we don't, I haven't read anything. I mean, there, there are individual things come out about particular technologies like you were mentioning. But nobody seems to try to put together a, a what's, what, what would you say, a whole combination of things. Which might work. Well, um, there's a couple of books. I mean, there's uh, John Michael Greer's uh, The Long Descent um, is quite good about that, about what, you, what we're going to do in a powered down era. He thinks, uh, uh, and there's also Michael Heinberg to some extent in his Power Down uh, book, uh, Heinberg, but John Michael Greer is, is quite good on that. Um, yeah, I agree that that's very important. Um, you know, we've got to bring together those kind of people with the social scientists and the humanities to try and figure out what we're going to do in the, the post-cheap oil world. Does anybody else have interesting technological ideas? I think the Germans are working on a new Heidelberg using uh, helium, but I don't know how far they've gone. They have, I think they built the prototype. They were actually thinking of using it in the, the northern part, you know, where there is no landing strip and whatever, yeah. uh, to carry heavy oil equipment. <laughs> Whether that is going to work or not. And I think there have been experiments on growing banana in Alberta, and it involves digging trenches and then covering the over with plastic. But I don't know again how far they've gone. It's, uh, I think some idea went around 30 years ago, long before. Um, but you know, or, or oranges, no, but it would be fantastic. <laughs> and, there, there are also problems with other resources. Um, the um, supplies of uh, rare earths and such things which are needed for uh, electronic technology, uh, they're running out. And uh, they're also, uh, most of them are under Chinese control. Um, so there's a great problem there. Um, and the question arises, how much of our electronic technology is going to survive? Uh, yeah. And that's another, another of the propaganda uh, bullshit they're putting out. There are rare earth in other places. The problem is we, it's too expensive to produce if you compare with the production in China. And again, it's the same story. We have always been able to buy banana cheaper than apple from D.C. And the banana comes from Guatemala, Belize, wherever else. And you have to wonder what do they pay the laborer yeah. if the, the apple from D.C. cost twice as much as the banana? And, you know, we don't have the climate either. You know, in a tropical place, you can produce banana in great quantities. So, you know, if something is wrong somewhere if it you, you know, buying into the system. There is an interesting book, I think, why your, your world is going to get smaller and smaller. Jeff Rubin. Sorry? Jeff Rubin. Yeah, I, I, I forget. I always have a terrible memory. <laughs> but it's kind of interesting because he's revisiting the argument of how can we afford to bring stuff in from China or how can we afford to sell rice rice producing country coming from the states and being cheaper than stuff produced locally. It's all an artificial manipulation of the system.
Well, he also says that there will be a bunker tariff, meaning that, that the cost of transportation from China and other parts of the world is going to rise so much that it is going to be greater than the savings on the cheap labor, and that it's going to bring back manufacturing to the global north. Um, Jeff Rubin was the chief economist of the CIBC Bank for 20 years. Yeah. Uh, and that, he's the author of this. It's a, it's a very good book. I'm, I'm using it in the course. But it is, it's a market view. Yeah. It's the market is going to take care of things. The problem with that view is that when, the, when the market does it, and there is the price of oil goes way up, guess what happens? The rich get, they can drive their Hummers to parties where the average working stiff or whatever is not going to be able to get to the, uh, the supermarket or to work. And there is a, in Britain there, they have uh, this idea to talk about fuel poverty. And they actually have governments dealing with the problem of fuel poverty. They said no one should be able to have to spend more than 10% of their income on heating their home. That this is actually a health issue. You get senior citizens and the poor who are living, and it and it, it you know it hurts their health. So they actually have a program where they're trying to uh, insulate the homes to give cheaper uh, fuel um, prices to people who are uh, uh, who are poor. And I think we should be looking at this question. That we're, this is going to be a major issue. If there is less of the stuff, and it's going to go up in price, is it only going to be the rich and the military that get it? I think that we need to introduce the idea that everybody has a right to a basic amount of energy. So we should have a pricing system, for example, for heating your homes or natural gas or whatever, that there is a basic price for, let's say, a thousand square foot place. And if you're going to use more than that, you got 2,000. We're going to raise the. We're going to more than double the price. If you got, if you're heating a 4,000 square foot place, the price is going to be, you know, five, ten times as high. So that you then, the right then, the average. I you know what I'm really worried about is, you know, what's going to happen to the widow who's 75, who is living on a basic income. Will she be able to heat her home through our very cold winters? And so the question of the social justice issue of who has access to this less amount of energy is going to be a major struggle that we're going to have to start thinking about. Um, I, I tried to talk to the NDP uh, a few years ago about, about this idea of fuel poverty and bringing this idea into Canada. Uh, it didn't get anywhere at the beginning, but I, I'm still, I don't give up. <laughs> OK. Uh, I think we'll, uh, Bring that to a halt. Um, Gordon never gives up. I can see he doesn't like to give up this interesting discussion either. Right. So um, thank you all for attending. And well, hold on a second. I want to remind you that we will be meeting again in two weeks' time. That's on the 15th. Um, and uh, the topic is going to be something which very nicely follows on from this discussion. Can localism revive community, community and challenge consumer society? Um, uh, you know, it, uh, one thing we didn't quite get onto in this discussion, uh, which is fine, um, is the change in, in values, the change in culture, um, that is going to be attendant on the various economic and resource changes um, that we'll be facing in the next 20 or 30 years. And I think this uh, next discussion will bring that up. So we're really heading into a discussion of, well, what is the healthy society going to look like um, in the post-carbon future? All right, so thank you very much for attending. Uh, could we give a hand to Steeps? And a hand to Gordon for handling this discussion. And I'll see you all in two weeks' time.